All right, we are rolling. So I have just uh, the, the chaplain, Jesse Sabatar. Uh, I keep want to say, wanting to make it more, more, ex more eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> then you gotta go Sabatar, <laughs> make it exciting. <laughs> there you go, Sabatar. Um, you're the author of a book, His Kingdom Comes in Power, as well as uh, having done a lot of um, interviews, podcasts, you do right on radio. Um, your website, Illuminate the Darkness, is a great source of information. You've been on Sarah Westall's uh, show quite a bit. So, um, you know, it's interesting because I was I was recommended to you and started listening to your story. And it's like, it, it, it certainly, you, you can, I feel like you can connect a lot of dots uh, for us and help us understand this uh, satanic empire. Um, let's start by just giving us, you know, I, I'm sure you've, you've gone into this a lot before, but just give us a little bit of, uh, of an introduction into your personal experience as much as you can you can relate. Yeah, um, are you wanting just like the childhood history or yeah. just so like think, a general overflow? Were you, were you born into this world and how essentially your, 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 your younger years, um, yeah, what that was like? Yeah, so I was born into what we would call the bloodline families and um, they go by many names commonly the elite, the cabal, the Illuminati, the brotherhood. Um, so I was born into the higher escalons of that group and was chosen at age four and a half for a very specific position in that world. Um, my proctor, who is a family member, um, is one of the queen mothers of darkness. And so one of the things that I really bring out as I'm speaking about this group is the structure. How do they operate? How do they work? Um, where are they working? Um, how does it connect between the physical, the spiritual? And um, so, you know, that was kind of my beginnings were, you know, those relationships with my proctor that beyond my control, I was chosen by you know, these individuals who are part of what I call this system um, that serves Lucifer. And um, Lucifer chose me very specifically for end time things and to set, help set things in place. And um, so, you know, that training began at age four and a half. Um, unbeknownst to him originally, um, the Lord was working behind the scenes. So I mix in a lot of my faith with my story. Um, I, I was saved at age three. So a year and a half before my, I was thrown into this occultic world and, and trained in the system, I had come to the Lord. And so I knew the difference between good and evil, light and dark. And really it became my training was a, a battleground, we could say. Um, you know, I, I went through training with some of my other teachers that are, you know, I've brought forward some of their names. Um, we had, you know, John Brennan, Michael Aquino, Michael Karkok, who was a Nazi. Um, he was the Ukrainian Legion of Defense leader um, for Hitler. And, um, and then I had on the witchcraft side, individuals like Gloria Vanderbilt and Lori Cabot Kent. Um, so those were my main teachers in the black arts, we'll, we'll call it. Um, so all of them, you know, were, I don't know what to call it besides an agenda. They all knew this Luciferian end time agenda. Yeah. And, you know, had been given prophecies and different things that, you know, told them the series of events and their job was to prepare and get everything ready in the economy, you know, financially, um, you know, in the system and, you know, move everything in that direction for this big end time system. So are you familiar with John Todd's testimony? Yes. Does that resonate as far as, was it similar what he was, what he claimed he was born into as far as the covens? Um, it, it's similar in some ways. 
in some ways it's different. Um, you know, my family was at the very top of the system. So they were, you had the five mothers of darkness and then you have the satanic council, which is all the heads of the 13 bloodline families. And then you have a 14th bloodline, which is the hidden bloodline, the Muslim brotherhood. So, um, you know, what he's describing is kind of what happens in um, the groups underneath those, um, we'll call it departments in the system. So right. it's a little different. He, he was yeah. he was really talking, I remember, uh, you know, hearing it years ago and just being fascinated because he talks about how they were controlling music and in particular what he was associated with was the control of music and as we know how music is magic and the frequency and vibration of what was put out and how so much of it is designed to basically put people into negative frequencies or to hypnotic states and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of it is encoded i've heard about rituals done around music um masters where they actually do uh like bring in black magicians to like cast spells on the master itself right and right. then cast it to the to the masses so um in terms of well another person i want to bring up then is you mentioned the 13 families this is a fritz springmeyer work uh on the 13 bloodlines does that correspond to the families or is it actually different than what he the families that he talks about no uh he what he says is is very very similar there's a few differences um I have talked with Fritz and we've talked through those differences. Um, so there were some of um, the major families or, or names that would fall under those categories. Um, he had kind of seen as, you know, not important or in the background. What he kind of displays are the face front of the system. So they're, they're true people, you know, the powerhouses, like you can, think of individuals, um, you know, like there's some that they bring forward that are kind of the face front of the system. Um, you know, like Gloria Vanderbilt was somebody that was out in public. She was well known. She lived a very wealthy life, but the real hierarchy people are behind the scenes. They live among us. There would be nothing distinguishing in their lives that would, um, you know, let you know that they're into this Luciferianism. Um, a lot of them have, you know, very strong cover lives that revolve around Christianity or uh, the Catholic life. And, um, you know, you would just see them as a regular person. You know, they're taught to live without the excess, um, yet, you know, whatever they need is available to them. So, you know, these higher families, they don't live wealthy. They're not publicly out there. People aren't going to recognize their faces. Um, and that's part of to protect the system, to protect who's really doing the programming and the running and the coordinating and organizing of everything. And so what is this Luciferian system about? What is their belief system? Well, um, you know, at the core of it, it's all about Satan or Lucifer's agenda. Um, you know, they, they really don't love God and they want to um, see this agenda fulfilled. They're promised all sorts of things, you know, fame, money, fortune. But above that, they're promised knowledge, knowledge that's not of this world. And they're promised eternal life that's the biggest thing that um, with that eternal life, it's not just that you live forever. It's that you are a God and you will, you know, rule as a God. So that's what they strive for. And, you know, in the backdrop, Satan's agenda has always been that he will usurp the throne of God, that he will sit upon the throne as God and when that happens, he will, you know, make all of those who follow him gods. That's his promise. Um, I can tell you it's quite different, you know, that that he's a liar, that he's, you know, told me to my face that he intends to kill everybody. You know, his goal is just to get his demonic army through those spiritual gates. 
And once he does, you know, he plans to try to take over the throne of God and he'll do away with all of the human hosts that um, have helped to get his legions of demons through the gate. So the idea of the human hosts are essentially um, people allowing themselves to be possessed by by demonic forces and in, in the process of service, basically by servicing, by serving that Luciferian uh, or satanic um, energy and, and, and force, essentially they're allowing themselves to, to host it, um, right? Is that the idea? That's the idea. Um, both, you know, if we talk about what the demons or the fallen angels really are, you know, they were angels that you know, chose not to serve God and were cast from heaven. And they have spiritual gifts just like we do. So one of the things that the system does is, you know, they want to line up humans that have the same spiritual gifts as those fallen angels. Because when you work together in conjunction with one another, um, those spiritual gifts are amplified. So that's why you see all the gift testing, all the different testings that go on in schools, the different games are formulated, you know, whether it's online games or it used to be board games. Um, you know, they do all these series of testing to see who can connect where spiritually. And, you know, the goal is always to amplify those spiritual gifts. Um, so in a sense, you're a host, but it, it's much deeper than that because it's not just like you're an empty shell or a shell with a spirit that this other being is just kind of coming in and shoving that spirit to the side. There's at a quantum level, there's an entanglement. You come into agreement with this spirit and the spirit, you know, operates at a spiritual level with both your physical body and your spiritual body. Precisely, precisely. And so is that the reason for this, these like blood rituals, sacrifice? I mean, is this actually feeding demonic entities with the blood of, of humans or is this simply uh, more, uh, how do you say, is it, is it a mixture of feeding demonic entities as well as basically proving allegiance? It, it can have multiple reasons. So it can be, um, you know, the, the entities are very bloodlusty. It's their way, it's kind of a mockery to God that they, um, you know, scripture says that the life is in the blood. And so, you know, when they consume that, what they believe philosophically is that, you know, that when they consume it, it becomes a part of themselves that they take ownership of that um so it gives them you know ties to the individual whose blood they've taken in the spiritual realm and they believe that gives them more you know power more access so whoever that individual has been connected to whatever land they've walked um you've kind of opened a big can of worms here <laughs> um, you know, because the blood is what gives us authority, dominion. And so it's about that dominion. And when they drink that blood, wherever that person has walked, wherever they've been, they believe it gives it, them access to that land and that dominion that that individual had. So like we could go further, like, so for them, you know, a physical display of that is, you know, we've got the Red Shoe Club, some of that's been brought forward. Uh, we know that, you know, the Pope is somebody who wears the red shoes um, with the Jesuits. And so um, when he gets shoes, they come from a very particular victim that he's chosen and if you think about it, it's kind of a dual meeting, you know, shoes have souls. And scripture tells us that wherever the soles of your feet trod, the Lord has given you that land. So what happens is when they take that victim's life and they make them into a pair of shoes, 
they're physically mocking God saying, now, you know, I, I get permission and I have rights to fight for the land wherever this person has trod. And so when they go into the heavenly throne room, you know, they fight for those rights in the heavenly places and fight for the footholds that they have, which they use for evil and wickedness um, versus as God intended, you know, it was meant to, for us to be bring righteousness and to put an end to wickedness and evil in the land. It's wild. It's just, you occurred to me the uh, the Tom, when he mentioned the red shoes, it reminded me of the, the man with the one red shoe with the Tom Hanks movie, like his first breakout movie that they starred in. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, okay. So what, and, and the pedophilia then, like, why is this such a, is this, is this feeding on the purity of, of innocence, the pure, the pure energy of, of, of children is that, you know, is that the reason why so many of these, these cultists are, you know, engaging in pedophilia? Um, well, there's two reasons. The first is that it, um, the enemy uses that as a form of blackmail that, you know, nobody, well, I can't say nobody, I guess, you know, I would say 5% of the individuals who are involved in this system really want to be there. You, you do just have people who, to be honest, their hearts are wicked and that's what they desire. But the other 95% don't. And so the enemy has to find a way to meld individuals' wills to do what he wants them to do. So, you know, that's one of their most common forms as they start off with, um, you know, different forms of blackmail. And it eventually will evolve to, you know, where they get you drugged or drunk or roofied and they get a picture of you with a child. And then from there, um, you know, it, it kind of, it's like you, you have a choice, you know, at that point, are you going to be in the system or are you not? If you're going to be in the system, everything under the sun that you could desire or want is going to be offered to you. If you choose not to be in the system, the threat is death to you. And most of all, to anybody you love or anything you love, they will start to take away everything and torture you until you decide to give in and be part of the system. So, you know, once you're in the system, it becomes a quota. You know, the enemy has different quotas that vary in the depth of evil. So you always start off in the lighter things, which a lighter thing would be the blackmail picture, you know, with the child. And then the next time it's going to be, well, no, now you've actually got to commit the act if you don't want to lose your family members. And there, you know, it has to be documented. There needs to be picture proof or video proof. Like you can't just say you've done these things. So, you know, this is how the system, the quota system of entanglement begins. And it just continues to escalate further and further to the point of, you know, the enemy doesn't want you just to participate and, and just do what you need to do to get by. He purposely sets it up where it escalates. And then his, his goal is to get you to the point where you are willingly participating and not only willingly participating, you are applauding others to partake your recruiting and bringing other people into the system to keep it going. Um, so that's the first aspect of that. Um, with the, remind me again exactly how you asked that question in the beginning, because I want to make sure I cover both parts fully in here. Well, just in terms of uh, the feeding on the energy of children, energy, is that part of why the pedophilia takes place? Is, is it, you know, is it has to do with energy feeding, basically, for, uh, the sexual energy of a, of a young child, the purity of a young child, is that, you know, you're just trying to understand why is it so common amongst the, right. the, the elite, essentially. So, so the second part of that is, is, you know, what's behind it, that, 
you know, you've got the enemy's end time agenda that he wants to usurp the throne of God. In order to do that, he has to get his demonic host back into heaven. And he has to do that through the spiritual gates. Um, you know, when they were cast down to earth, there was a veil that was put up between, you know, the spiritual entities being able to go back into the throne room of God. Satan is allowed back in there, but not with his demonic host. So how do the spiritual gates operate? And this is important to that question. Um, scripture tells us that, you know, we enter the gates with thanksgiving in our heart. Thanksgiving, emotions, feelings, everything on earth resonates a frequency, a, a resonance, a, a, has a harmonic song. Okay, so the spiritual gates operate at that frequency of thanksgiving. The enemy cannot be thankful to open the gates. The true thankfulness is gone because they've all been cast out of heaven. They've been cast from the presence of God. So what's the closest thing that they can get to that same frequency that will open those spiritual gates? And that's delight or ecstasy. Okay. Now, why they choose the young is because you know, that initial reaction, that initial feeling is what's going to get them that frequency to open those gates. So now you have, you know, really what they're doing with the pedophilia, it, it's not about, you know, necessarily lust or, you know, a sick desire to harm children. Like it's, it's about that sex magic. And, you know, to to appease Satan, to appease the demons, to reach those higher levels in that system, you have to be good at sex magic. And unfortunately, the only way they can get that is, you know, they have to involve children. Um, so that's kind of the way, I don't know how else to explain it, but that's really what's behind this, is that drive to open and operate the spiritual gates and in terms of your own story i mean i know you mentioned when you were young being involved with sort of stargates or portals or this kind of working um you mentioned michael aquino and mm -hmm. can you elaborate on some of the what that was about essentially what what you were being tasked with and what you came to understand yeah um with that i'm gonna actually be doing a, a huge show on that um this upcoming friday on the reveal report um but w basically what's behind it is that um with my position i had to work hand in hand with individuals you know who were operating and and getting things ready with the system with that end time agenda so part of my role was that, you know, on a certain date, I was supposed to perform a certain ritual and hand the system over to the Antichrist. Um, you know, so all of that training with Aquino, with Brennan, was all in prep for getting things ready to hand over that system to the Antichrist and to open the spiritual gates. Um, you know, as they did testing and stuff for me as a child, um, you know, they realized that I could hear and see and feel in the spiritual realm. So that ability, you know, everybody has that ability. Um, a lot of times the system will kind of squash it, they'll push it down, they don't want people to know, or acknowledge that they can hear, see and feel in the spirit realm. So, you know, I was one of those kids that I, I wasn't gonna just pretend it was imagination when I was hearing or seeing things. I was very literal. And, you know, with my testing, you know, it started with my proctor and different teachers. They would ask me, you know, do you hear what the spirits are saying? 
And I would be like, yes. And then they would say, well, tell us, what were they saying? And so I'd have to repeat back word for word what I had heard the entity saying. Well, finally, I got tired of, you know, of kind of this game that they were playing. And so I just started, you know, I, I, as I heard things, I just started blurting it out, you know, and a lot of it was stuff that, you know, might've been private communications between these demons and their hosts and stuff they didn't want everybody to know. And I would just be like, this is what was said, you know? And so that, you know, became a problem for them. Um, and so they ended up putting me then, you know, like kind of the next step after they knew that I had those gifts that they were um, pretty refined they started me off in the looking glass project. So with that project, um, they will have children with core groups of three. Usually it's a girl and two boys. And the girl will have skills that basically it's that, you know, you hear, see and feel in the spirit world. Um, they kind of twist it a little bit and they call that gift clairvoyance. Um, so what they want to do is, you know, with the system, they set you up with this spiritual gate and you basically communicate with this spirit and all three of you are kind of in this communication in the spiritual world. Like you're pulled, I don't know how to explain it other than you're pulled into the spirit world. Um, people are pulled into that spiritual engagement in different ways. So um, you know, some of the, some of the children are what we call, they're all, I guess they classify them technically as remote viewers, but some remote view through astral projection. So literally their physical body will be one place, but their spirit goes, enters into that spiritual world. Um, the others of us, it's our spirit does not leave our body. And so literally it's like we're seeing a vision or a dream. So we see both the physical world and the spiritual world at the same time and can interact in both worlds at the same time versus someone whose spirit leaves their body and their astral projecting, they can't operate in the physical world while they're operating in the spiritual world. They're bound to either be operating in one or the other. So, you know, my core group, all three of us were, you know, remote viewers with vision. And so we would see almost the exact same thing. So they would have us, you know, interacting, um, but they, they particularly, you know, pick it where you're all seeing the same vision, but you see different aspects of the vision. So for me, like I could, I would always see whatever the end result was going to be. So whatever we're seeing, I see the end result. My training partner, he would see, you know, all the steps that are going to happen. He couldn't see the end result, but he would see like all the series of events that led up to that end event. And then he would see the consequences. Like if you know, if that happened, then this would be the outcome. If that happened, this would be the outcome. But he wouldn't know which was the final outcome. And then the other boy who was with us, he just saw, you know, this and this and this and this are going to happen. So what they do, they purposely pick three children, you know, who perceive things those way because that it's like serves as a triple check for them. You know, they then do um, what we call biofeedback where, you know, you, after the vision, you go with somebody and you, you word for word in, you know, describe or draw pictures exactly what you saw, heard and felt. And then they compare those three notes. And by comparing, you know, it's like, okay, this kid saw this is gonna happen first, this is gonna happen second, this is gonna happen third. This kid saw, you know, this is going to happen first, second, third, but he also saw these other things. And if those things happen, these will be the, this will be the result. 
And then the last kid sees this is the result. And so when they started to compare things in that way, what they tried to do then was change time. Like if we don't want this to be the end result, which step do we need to try to change in order to get a different outcome? So that's the premise of looking glasses is they're playing, trying to play with time, trying to dictate what God has ordained. Um, you know, to find three kids that can actually give biofeedback that's close to each other is kind of hard. You know, our group was probably one of the higher level groups. Me and my training partner gave 100% feedback. So that meant that everything that we said was, you know, could be comparable. Um, you know, it was like telling the whole story. And then the third child with us, he was the closest they could find to us, but his biofeedback was only, he saw only 60% of what we reported. Um, and then they would, you know, they would connect us as, as you get further in this, um, you know, then they would connect you with different military um, generals or soldiers who were in these PSYOP remote viewing programs. And so then the next phase was Star Wars Now. So you would be interacting with military individuals who could be part of the Jedi program, Sunstreak, Flame Grill, uh, the Phoenix Project, any of those, and you would start interacting with those individuals interfacing with those spiritual gates. And at that point, they would teach you to operate in that spiritual world. You know, it's like, okay, we've got somebody we need to locate. Where is that person? And you would start learning through your remote viewing how to locate those people and how to assess you know, what is the condition of that person? Um, you know, where are they at? What do they need? Are they okay? Um, you know, what are they doing? What are they saying? It, it got quite interesting. Um, we had one individual who, you know, was part of our group um, who uh, used hawks and the hawks could travel through the spirit world to other countries. They would um, watch from the rafters and the hawks had learned, you know, to recognize symbols in order. And so they could come back and they could, you know, type with their beak or, um, you know, they'd have different um sometimes boards that these birds would use and they could just, you know, repeat from memorization what they had seen, if it was like in written form on somebody's desk. So this was a way they were doing spying and different things like that. Um, one of those individuals, I'll just, I can't say names, but he has come forward now um, with some stuff. And so, it's just, it's interesting, uh, the things that they can do. Um, so that was, those were the first two levels. And then once you get past Star Wars now, um, you know, where you're able to open the spiritual gates, you're able to enter them on your own, you can close them um, and, uh, you know, operate in and out of those, then you go into the voice of God project. And, you know, that's the higher levels. It's going to be the Phoenix project. Um, and, you know, some of Sunstreak, um, and, you know, Artemis, some of those other ones like that. And you're going to um, be fully operating in that world. You'll be getting missions um, you'll have a team that you work with, you have objectives, um, and, you know, their goal with that, when they start off, you know, a lot of what they display and publicly 
or not publicly, I'll say among the government individuals, you know, they advertise that really the premise of that group is to have operational warriors in the spirit world um, doing psyops and things, but it's supposed to be for protection. It's supposed to be for the good of our country, things like that. Um, what it ends up being is, is the opposite. Um, literally they were, you know, what I saw, they were making children into weapons. They were using spiritual gifts, um, you know, to, to make changes in other countries or who was running other countries um, to cause harm to people. Um, they were connecting those children with the high level demonic generals and you know, so then really they're fulfilling Lucifer's military agenda versus our country's military agenda. So this was the extent that, you know, I knew Aquino and Brennan to be involved in this um, and, well, and they would hide. Well, let me ask you then, because Aquino, Aquino I, I interviewed and I asked him specifically, I said, have you ever, you know, utilized children for your mind control work? You know, you're so interested in mind control. And he said, no, because children are not, they're too emotionally, uh, how do you say, like they're not, they can't, they're not in control of their emotions. So they're not good for mind control. So he was lying or was he, would he just not categorize it as mind control as far as the operational stuff that he was doing? He didn't classify it as mind control. Mind control was the stuff Mengele and the Nazis were doing. Um, what Aquino specifically did was, you know, called mind construction. So with that, um, you, you, in a way, you do gain control of of the emotions. Um, you know, they teach children to have full control of those. Let me think how to put this. Um, like it, it's probably easier to give as an example. One that I give is, you know, with this pandemic, um, you know, they'll say, if you wear, a, or, you know, if you want to be a good citizen, if you're globally minded, you'll wear a mask. And because you care about your elderly neighbors, you care about the safety of the people around you. Well, so, you know, your will may be, I don't want to wear a mask, I'm not going to wear a mask. But now what they've done is they've appealed to your ethical and your moral constructs. And so you think, if I don't wear a mask, then I'm not being a good person. And it displays that I don't care about my neighbors. I don't care about their life or their death. So, you know, what are you, what is your will going to do? You obviously, you want to be a good person. You want others to know that you care about them, that you care about life and death. So you're going to wear a mask. So that was his game. He played with the mind constructs to meld the will to people. Um, he they or he specifically hid a lot of things the way they got away with not letting everybody know there were children involved is that he and you can go through a lot of his stuff he uses the word potential potential was the name that he gave for children so as you read some of these experiments go back and see how many times you see the word potential um, you know, he also hid, you know, where the experiment records were kept, you know, legally, they're supposed to go through uh, an, a facet of our government, where the public after a certain time can request or, you know, access those documents. And, you know, we've got that system available. What he did was he created this project called the Transformation Project. The Transformation Project literally is the headquarters where they keep the unadapted uh, forms of these experiments. So it does have all the pictures of the children. It has the pictures of them displaying them as weapons, selling them as weapons to other countries. Um, you know, displaying the things that they can do in the spirit world. So, 
you know, it's, it's there in San Francisco, California, but no public person can, because it's a project, you can't just write and, and, you know, say, I want a copy of the Star Wars Now project unredacted, you know, because it's a project that it doesn't have to give full reveal. That's how he hid stuff. He, he admits it. He, he's yeah. admitted oh, it yeah. on shows. He's admitted it in his books about the transformation project. Um, so I'm just curious, would you say then uh, Kathy O'Brien's testimony as far as what you've seen of, of her story, does that resonate with anything that you went through specifically? Because it seems like she was used for a different purpose, more of a, more of a you could not like a, a born kind of thing, but more of a psychic. You're more psychic spy and she was more uh, being used for physical um, you know, how do you say, programs, um, operations. Uh, sexual slavery, this kind of stuff. But does that resonate with what uh, you you know about the projects? Absolutely, yeah. She even names like the same um, entities that were over those projects. So Apollon, um, sometimes he was called Apollo or Abaddon. Fiona Barnett names that one as well, Apollo. Um, you know, Aquino, you know, even in his book, he lists the different um, some of the different training centers that kids are put through. He worked hand in hand with Disney. Um, he worked with the Alpha um, Training Center for the CIA in Australia. Um, you know, he names areas that Kathy was put through. Um, you know, so I would validate, I would say her testimony is validated. It is what I saw of children that um, I would say were, I don't want to give class necessarily, but other kids that were in the program during my time were doing the same things that she talks about. Indeed. So the program was the same, you know, right. with a 20 year difference. Now, you're familiar with Arizona Wilder's testimony. That was back in the nineties. Was she, I can't remember if she said mother of darkness training as well. Mother goddess. Huh? She was mother goddess. Mother goddess. Okay. Yeah. So um, how does, yeah, exactly. How does her, how do you say, uh, how does that connect to what you were doing specifically in terms of um, she seems to have been involved with rituals and seeing, you know, shape shifting or reptilian forms. Um, does this resonate with any of your experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so with her placement, um, you know, what you have after you have the satanic council is that the system starts to break into departments that run the system um, in the different quadrants, both internationally and in the U.S. So the mother goddesses are going to be individuals who who run the system usually statewide, usually they're over a state or over several cities and they run all the covens uh, for witches and warlocks that are in that state. So she would have been somebody who, you know, was in charge of overseeing the rituals, um, the different things that are required of that occultic group in her region. So that's how that would be classified. Um, as to, you know, the shape shifting, I can speak to that, but I didn't, I've never seen anybody who shape shifted into a reptilian. What I did see, you know, we had, I grew up with the protector. So those were individuals who were assigned to you to provide your protection. Um, you know, they, they provide it for all the elite. So at the higher levels, each person is going to be assigned a protector. These are individuals who, you know, it, it goes back generations. So they have served the elite, you know, for thousands of generations. They're born into this family. At age five, they take their covenant or their, their first right. And that first, with that first right, they inherit their families 
generational spirits or entities that have helped them to, to do the things that they do as a protector. Um, so they, they enter into that covenant with that spirit. Um, not all of those entities are shape-shifting entities, but some of them are. So, you know, I grew up with, you know, there were six departments for the protector assassins and two of those departments, one is, is strongly run by the family lines that come out of the line of Rasputin and they're werewolves. And so their shape-shifting demons allow them to change into that form. Um, the third department is the vampires. And so again, there you, you've got the family that comes from the Romanoff line, and they are able to shape-shift into those entities at times. Um, and again, you know, we've talked about how at a quantum level, they've entered into a contract with this being. Um, you know, one of my close friends, when I, you know, I talked to him the one time about that process and I said, you know, is it like you take a drink or can you will it? Or is it that spirit that wills it? Like what causes the change and does it physically happen? Or is it like that the, it causes almost like a visual um, disturbance that the people who are looking at you, it appears that you've changed, but you really haven't, you know, um, is the spirit changing the visual perception? And he said, no, he said that, that it literally physically changes them, the signs of this, and, and there are disorders. So there's people that you can scientifically, um, you know, witness these disorders, but he said, you know, the spirits will shift their bones, put them in different places. So then they end up with ligament, um, tendon and, um, you know, damage in, in those areas, a lot of joint issues. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting when you look into that. Indeed. Um, so well, I would validate that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, for you testimony on that you mentioned seeing lucifer so just you know, when he spoke to you did you see him or what was his form i'm just curious if, if you could describe it yeah um i've seen him in four different forms um his first form is is what i would classify as kind of like looking like a shadow of a man so it just appears like this random shadow of a man wherever you're at um but it's more than just a shadow like it's he's got almost like this black covering or I called it kind of his little crusty armor. So it'd be like the shadow with this crusty black armor on him. Um, that was his first form. His second form is also of as a man. And um, so that's the one you'll hear a lot of the brides of Satan um, talk about where, you know, he shows up in appearance as a, a very handsome man glowing kind of not like glowing glowing but it's kind of like he's got that glittery looked tanned look very alluring very attractive um and then the other two forms were both as different types of dragons the one was just a one-headed dragon and the other it was a huge red dragon with seven heads so those were the four different forms i've seen him at different times um, usually he only appears as a dragon during certain rituals. Um, so, and so just to talk about the mother of darkness, um, what this means essentially, like what, you know, what was the intention? Um, you mentioned Gloria Vanderbilt, whose son is Anderson Cooper, and certainly we know he's CIA background, but certainly comes across to me as some kind of <laughs> bloodline bad guy. Um, what does this mean to be part of the Mothers of Darkness? And what was that, you know, you talk about building out the New World Order, the end times New World Order agenda. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it goes hand in hand, correct? Right. So the mother's sole role is, is to kind of act as the CEOs of of Lucifer's system. So, you know, part of that role, one aspect is that they do all the spiritual gift testing. So they will, um, 
you know, whether it's through remote viewing, whether it's physically being present and doing tests on children, they will discern, you know, what is that child's spiritual gift? They make the choice if a child, you know, whether they're born bloodline or whether they're not bloodline, they'll decide if they want to put them into a position into the monarch programming. So um, usually you'll see like one of my experiences was that they would use different places like the Frank Lloyd Wright houses. They would use, um, you know, fairs that were going on at schools. And you would see like, you know, you'd have these events where all these teachers would be coming through with their classrooms, what looked like their classrooms. You know, a teacher with all, with a, a row of children and they're all in nice neat rows and, you know, looking at whatever they're supposed to be looking at. Well, the mother of darkness would walk past and as she's walking past, that teacher, that handler is watching her and she either would nod her head, which would mean, yes, I want that child in the system. Um, so that child then would be entered into the monarch programming. Um, if she held up her finger as she passed that child, it meant that child was an expendable. They now, instead of being an insurance policy where they're, you know, like the hierarchy children who are entered into the program, they are what ensures the system keeps operating, keeps going. Okay. The other kids, they call the, you know, not my term, they call them the expendable children. They're their assets. They then are sold in different forms to make the system money. And so, you know, they make that choice and that decision. Um, part of that is knowing the spiritual beings. Um, you know, they're very aware of what are the spiritual gifts of these different angelic hierarchy. And they're purposely looking for children that are going to be compatible with those spiritual hosts. And their job is to get them in the right program so that those children are then trained to operate in conjunction with those spiritual hosts. And the end time goal is to make them into, you know, soldiers for Satan's army so that they can, you know, get into heaven. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of, I don't know what else to say, but, you know, it is a complicated process. Those are kind of their top roles are just ensuring the running of that system. Um, there's a lot of training, a lot of testing. Um, then you get into the whole aspect with Satan. Um, as the CEOs, they are required to meet every single night with Satan. And he dictates, you know, what the day, what the week, what the month's goals and plans are. And their job is to make sure that that happens. So, you know, they're going to each mother oversees one of the quadrants, um, both internationally as well as in the US. Um, underneath them, you know, they're connected to the satanic council members for that quadrant. So that's going to be the heads of the family. So when Satan dictates an order, they're going to relay that order to the individuals under them, the satanic councilmen then are going to relay those orders to the high grand high priest and high priestesses. So those were individuals like Gloria Vanderbilt. She was a grand high priestess for the East Quadrant in the U.S. So, you know, the mothers would relay it to the people who were over the Eastern Quadrant, which was George Soros, um, who then would dictate it to Gloria Vanderbilt. And then from her, she would dictate it to the, to the high priest and priestesses who were underneath her. So, you know, we see some of those connections, um, you know, Marina Abravomik, um, we had, uh, you know, um, Madonna, Beyonce, um, those individuals are, were all under Gloria Vanderbilt. Um, for the women. Um, then you have, you know, beyond 
like the high priests and priestesses, then they're going to relay the messages to the departments. So you've got those who oversee the Satanists, those who oversee the Masons, the Kabbalah, the Mormons, and the Jesuit Catholics. And so those organizations then are where the programming happens. They each have a different aspect of the monarch program. The Masons are the ones that are, and, and some of the higher level Jesuits are going to be connected to the military. And so the monarch program in that system and department then has different names based on what positions the kids are being trained for. So you could have, you know, MK Ultra, you could have Project Gemini or Orion. Um, each of them are going to basically, they're all the monarch program, but they're just different names. In the Jesuit system or the Catholic Church, um, that program is called the Carousel Program. So if you get a hold of like Fritz Springmeier and Siska Wheeler's book, the total mind control program. She breaks down in that book some of those different names that MK Ultra goes under. So it's kind of like special classes, like you know, you've got the overall umbrella of the program, but then it breaks into different classes or groups based on positions or specialties that those individuals will be learning and operating in. And so this agenda, as we understand it, is essentially what we've talked about with the New World Order, essentially the destruction, right. of, the, destruction of uh, the nation state, the, you know, basically the absorption of all power into a one world banking, uh, increased, you know, this, this sort of corporate top down control of life. Um, this is this is the ultimate agenda that they've been moving towards. And where are we in that picture from your perspective, you know, both spiritually, um, I guess you could say, yeah, I mean, spiritually, uh, energetically, it feels to me like they're actually at their end. And I don't, it doesn't feel like they are winning, even though uh, they perpetuated this life, you know, that, how do you say, they perpetuated this, this false system, but I feel like it's coming to its end. So, and obviously someone like yourself feeling that, you know, feeling the power of God, you were chosen basically to be put, worked out of it. To me, there's always this higher power of God's universe that ultimately is the living universe that is what they, the dark side is feeding upon. It's just, it, it doesn't, you know, evil itself is the inversion of life. So it's essentially been um, promoting the, you know, the ego of, of these power hungry psychopaths. Um, but ultimately that system is sort of coming to its end itself. The end time is that system, the antichrist system that we now see right on mass. And then it's like, this is where is this is basically where it goes to die <laughs> when it rolls out its full form. That's right. sort of its final hurrah. It feels to me. Yeah, I, I would agree. We are in the final hurrahs, and you know, just like you said, um, you do. You know, above all, we have God who's sovereign over all things, and He's dictated. You know, from the very beginning, um, the beginning and the end of of creation, and you, you know, he put things in place. So he, he did decree that there would be an antichrist. He would allow that. He would allow this period of time where Lucifer gets to run his kingdom. And, you know, he has dominion over the earth. And we see, you know, what we kind of see in the process of happening right now was that just this past year, April 24th, um, 2020, part of the mother's job was to hand that system, you know, it was a matriarchal system before that, where, you know, Satan dictated his power to the mothers. But on April 24th, that system was put into the hands of the Antichrist. So now it's changed hands from a matriarchal run system to a patriarchal run system. And it's meant to be a mockery. You know, in scripture, you have the father God who had his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who he gives control and power and authority of his kingdom to. And what does Jesus do with it? He places it back under the feet of the father. 
So in the same way, you know, the book of Revelations tells us that who does Satan give the power of his kingdom to? He gives it to the Antichrist. And that Antichrist job then is to rule that kingdom, to bring it to a certain point and to put it back under Satan's control. And, you know, there's very specific things that are outlined in the book of Revelations that we haven't seen happen yet. Um, you know, it talks about that, you know, the Antichrist has control of this kingdom now, but it will get to the point where he will stand in the temple of Israel and he will declare himself God. We haven't seen that happen yet. And it's after that happens that then he breaks out and makes war against the saints of God. And he will go after every single one who claims to be on that side of God to kill and destroy. And that's also part of Satan's end time agenda you know, he, he wants to kill all the Christians, then he's going to use those who've served him to host his, you know, his demonic army to get him through those gates. And then he's going to destroy them also. He, he just plans to get through those gates with his, you know, with his demonic army and nobody else. So all those things we still, you know, like we're in that end period the last things are happening, but I wouldn't say like we're right at the end. And it, again, I wouldn't say the enemy's won because we already know the outcome of the story, that we have the victory. And, you know, so that's part of what the Lord's called me to do is that understanding how the system operates, how it works, understanding what the enemy's doing, you know, get to get that knowledge out there, to get the Christians and the people who are standing up against the system to stand up together. Um, you know, we're not helpless. We don't have to just lay down and die. You know, we can fight this enemy. And one of the greatest ways we can fight is by getting those who are in the system out of the system. You know, if Satan doesn't have individuals who can host his demonic army, you know, he, he's not going to be very effective in his end time agenda. So that's been part of my goal is to target the system from the inside to, to go after his highest players and to bring those players out, you know, because then those hosts, they're not getting the people that they operate with the best. You know, if they're choosing people, it's those who, you know, that they don't function with best. And, you know, those people are out of that 5% that really want to be in the system, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting. What happened? So you mentioned figure. April, April of, of 2020 or 2021, when you say it was uh, something about the system was inaugurated, you're saying? Yeah, the Antichrist was, so the system changed hands on that date. Um, there were, there were a series of end time rituals that I partook in as a child that, you know, we just, we were preparing for those end time rituals. So, you know, Lucifer is very picky. He, he wants all of his rituals to be absolutely perfect. So these things that are happening now you know, when I was a kid, I was practicing for these things and it would be the rituals, you know, like you were learning what's supposed to happen, where you're supposed to stand. Um, so there was a series of prophetic books called the books of the mothers. And um, each of the books were opened at a different time. So it actually started in um, June of 2019. And so I knew, like we were trained, that as soon as that first book is opened, then there were certain dates when the next ones would follow. The final book to be opened was the fifth book. And that was part of my job was to open that book, which would mean that you open it and you read the prophecies that are within it. And um, I just knew, you know, that that 
whenever that first one got opened, the following April was when that fifth book was to be opened. Um, the, you know, it's these are very interesting books. Um, they they've been kept at a, a Catholic church, St. Peter's in Rockford, Illinois, you know, for centuries, and they're not by no means your normal type of book. Um, they're made, uh, I don't know how graphic I can, I won't get too graphic on here, but they're made from human skin. So all the pages are human skin and they're what we call living books. So there's a spiritual entity that literally embodies the book. And so um, if you were to open the pages, they would be blank. And the books have to be connected with the individual who's supposed to be able to see or read those prophecies before the event happens. So as a child, we went through a special ritual where each of the mothers were connected by blood to one of these books. And it's your blood that opens the prophecy. And once your blood is applied on the page, the words will appear for you to read. So like the Necronomicon, by the way. Yes, very, very similar. That also is a living book. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those were some of the preparatory rituals that we went through for that. Um, so what happened this April was that I did not show, I did not open the book. And in fact, um, you know, things were done to make sure that it was not opened um each of the the prophecies within it um were meant to kind of again be a mockery of the life of christ so you had with the first book um it it anointed the antichrist with his birth um the second book was about his baptism uh with the third book he was um commissioned which means called with the fourth book, he went through a period of temptation. And with the fifth book, he was to be consummated into his position. So um, that fifth step never happened, but still he took his place. And, um, you know, he's kind of, I don't know if it'd be operating half mass then, or, you know, what the spiritual complications are going to be for him with that. Um, but things were not, did not go as they had planned, so. It's fascinating. So basically, uh, their, their, yeah, their time is short. We get that. <laughs> their time is short. Yeah. Um, and again, so do you think that just, just the people that you, you refer to, you know, that are, work, that are basically part of this, you know, this cabal and this bloodline, these bloodline families, um, do you think that they're even like, have consciousness and an awareness that you know essentially that they are serving something that is ultimately dark and they just they are just you know are they possessed in a sense do you think by it or do they just have no conscience left i mean are they their souls even are they even in possession of their souls at this point um at the highest levels yes they are in possession of their souls and they do know exactly what they're doing um you know, they're, they're very aware. Um, as you get into those who are programmed, um, you know, their souls are still in their bodies, but the control is an issue because they may have, you know, they're battling with entities for the use of their own body. Those entities are able to control to an aspect. So sometimes they do you know, black out and they have no idea what their body's been used for. They have no memories of what they've done, where they've been. Um, you know, the, the spirit does not allow that. Um, sometimes they have built in altars or programs in their mind where, you know, they've got different personalities or different. It, I'm trying to think how to describe that. You know, a lot of times it's called DID for dissociative disorder or multiple personalities was the old name for it. So basically the system 
you know, would build these different compartments within the mind where it almost was like you, you could be like 10 different individuals living within one body, yet it's all you, but you see yourself in different ways and you can't, you know, each one is distinct. So you don't realize that you've got these other personalities as well living within you. And then, you know, your handler or the person controlling you you would use access codes or different trigger things. It could be as simple as walking by you wearing a red scarf. And you were trained that when you see that red scarf, you know, your beta kitty sex uh, worker personality is pulled up. And then as that personality is pulled up, you could be programmed or wired to have certain jobs that you would fulfill, or they may give you a job. Um, so one of the ladies that I knew, you know, they, like one time, um, they got her at a gas station. And so what happened is a guy just pulled up and he was like, Hey, Hey, um, that guy over there just gave me a note. Well, she went to look and there wasn't a guy, but he put in her hand this note. And when she saw the note, it had the trigger word on it and it, it made her that beta kitty come out and she knew then she was programmed that when she was triggered, then she would go to the Masonic lodge at a certain time. And that's where they would pimp her out. So, um, so it just depends on where in the system the person is, whether it's conscious or not conscious, you know, and how controlled they are or what spirits have control of them. I think that's that explains a lot um yeah i mean i guess the only final question i have is you just describe some of the magical battles that you um have witnessed or, or involved with um can you explain how that plays out essentially for people that you know they think of it like as a harry potter reality right you know the fact that this magic is is real and essentially it does it's like we are living in a multi-dimensional reality right right that's the essence of it. Yeah, that's, that's the reality of it is that, you know, we have the physical world, but we have the spiritual world as well. And all of us are created to function in both of those realms together. Um, but we, you know, from a young age, they, they use words, it's part of the programming, you know, like if you, you're seeing somebody as a kid and you you tell your mom, hey, I saw that person, what's the first response you get? Oh, is that your imagination? Is that your imaginary friend? You may see this person or being multiple times. And yet every time you're gonna to be told that's your imagination, that it's not real. You know, you may even be able to hear, see and interact with that being or person and you're still told it's not real. So you're, you're taught to doubt your gifts and your abilities in that, in those realms. Um, so you're kind of remind me again, where, yeah, just in terms of how those, how those magic, how those magical battles essentially work. Yeah. So in, you know, it varies in levels. Um, you know, it could be, I guess it depends if, you know, they're calling you into an operation or if the, you know, from the Lord's perspective, it was, it was really different for me as a kid because, you know, they would throw us into a room and there would be, you know, individuals in there that might be defectors, people who are trying to run and get out of the system, you know, so what would happen is they'd have those persons chained or somehow stuck in this room that would be completely dark in a basement and you know we'd go walking and next thing we know we'd get shoved into this room and the door gets locked behind me and my training partner and you know they're saying through the keyhole either you guys live or he lives okay so now we know there's someone else in the room and that's the whole thing is that you would be forced to fight to the death, you know, only either the kids or the guy walks out one or the other. 
And that was kind of their, their way of punishing people. And so that was the physical aspect of this battle is that you were entering into physical fighting. You know, that's why we had Michael Carcock, who was the defense legion leader of the Nazis, train us. We had to know how to defend and protect ourselves in, these phys in the physical aspect of the battle. But then you have the whole demonic witchcraft side. You've got spirits that are, you know, that person who's defecting out of the system is a trained high level witch warlock that sometimes it was a wolf or a vampire, you know? So now you're dealing not only with the physical person but you've also got these beings who can do things in the physical world. So you're fighting multiple individuals in this battle and, you know, they teach you you know, things like spells or hexes or, you know, invocations, you're taught to summon demons that will fight for you or with you. So the demons will battle amongst themselves for power. In the end, whoever wins that battle then has possession or has soul ties now with that other person's spirits that they were connected to. So you, you gain more spirits allegiance, whoever the top dog in the battle is, gets the allegiance of the demonic army. So the higher spirits you, you know, if you're fighting just against low level soldier spirits, you know, you, you could have th thousands upon thousands of those guys. Okay. But those guys, if they have to fight against a demonic general, they're not going to get very far because they're not skilled in battle versus the demonic generals are, are very skilled, you know, and usually they just enter the field and these little guys see them and they run, you know, like little chickens because they're scared. And so early on, you know, as we were in this, I remember one day, you know, we were playing chess at um, Gloria Vanderbilt's house while we were waiting to take place in one of these battles. And I, you know, I looked at my training partner and I was like, why are we even physically fighting the humans? Like we see the demonic general, like Bible says, you know, says heal the sick, you know, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out the demons. Why are we just not casting out the demon? If we cast out the demon, these people have no power besides their physical abilities. You know, and it's like, we're highly trained in defense. So, you know, most of them are not trained like we are in defense. So why don't we just attack those demonic generals? And so we started doing that. Like we would just go in and that would be our focus was taking out that general, rebuking them, getting them off the field. And once we did that, you know, the, the witches, the warlocks, they're so used to that summoning those invocations. They're used to that, you know, supernatural power coming through their spiritual gifts through that spirit that they're working in conjunction with. It's like, you know, it's relatable to when you take out that demon, it's like taking away their sword and their, or their bow and arrow, you know, they're highly trained in doing battle a certain way. So when you take away their main weapon, they don't know how to function in the battle. And it throws them off and you have that period where they're thrown off, they don't know what to do. And that's when we were able to overcome them and you know, win the battle. And so um, you know, this is at the higher levels and Anybody is able to do this if you're trained, you know, the majority of it, it comes through knowing what your weapons through the word of God is, um, you know, which that's one of our weapons is being able to rebuke these spirits, we can rebuke these entities, we can cast them out, we can bind them, and we can take away, you know, they, they're all given dominion over pieces of land. 
Like that's why they connect with human beings. The more human beings they're connected to, as we talked about, you know, wherever the sole of your feet tread, the Lord gives you that land as a possession. And so these, these spirits and entities are greedy. They want as much as they can get. So they're going to connect to as many people across the quadrants as they're allowed to. But as you target them and rebuke them and anoint and take back that property, they have nothing. They have no foothold to stand on. Um, you know, scripture says the righteous inherit the land. So we have that authority to come in and, you know, to rebuke them, to remove their stronghold. Once we remove the strong man, then we have the ability to remove whatever he was operating in wickedness. So that includes the child trafficking. It includes the different strongholds that they put people under, you know, the sexual sins, the drugs, the drinking, um, you know, pornography, whatever the stronghold is, you have the right then to remove that stronghold from the land and to remove, you know, scripture talks about it, that those strongholds are like oppression over people. And you know, so as you go into an area, whatever strongholds are there are going to oppress you and tempt you and, you know, weaken you until you give in and you, you give way to those demons and their strongholds over you. But if we do the opposite, you know, we go in, we take the stronghold, we take possession, then that's where we see healing in the land. We see that that wickedness stops. It, it, has its force to stop you know we can stop the child trafficking we can stop the drug addictions we can you know stop the people who are running those things and and bring in the things that are good and right and build our communities that are healthy and safe for our kids yes exactly it's a choice um it's always a choice this is an amazing conversation i mean we could go it's like this could go for hours. I, I, it's already been, I think, almost an hour and a half. And uh, I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the insights and the time you've given us today. Um, yeah, thank yeah, you. You shared a lot. You shared a lot. And it's a lot to, uh, to take in and absorb and just, you know, reflect on. Because ultimately, yes, this is a, a multidimensional war that, you know, we have to just, we have to come to accept. That's really the message that uh, I'm looking to convey with the documentary and with most mm -hmm. of the work I do, it's like, this is not just about physical material, you know, existence. That's completely, that's, that is the lie that's been sold to many people for too long. You know, that right. this is just, oh, just the physical uh, evolutionary process of random chance. And uh, we're just a random species on a random planet. No, mm -hmm. this is exactly what we are. You know, we are chosen for this time and this moment. And uh, it's time for us to answer the call. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you for, uh, for sharing with us. And uh, definitely we look, you know, we look forward to the, the upcoming content, you know, you got a lot mm -hmm. of things to share and more, more elaboration. So I'll, we'll, we'll leave it to the other videos to elaborate into more detail, but I think this is a great overview. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.